Hello and welcome to another pre-lab. Today's pre-lab. Hello and welcome to another pre-lab. Today's pre-lab is going to be about the microscope. So why do we use microscopes? We use microscopes because there are an estimated 1.6 billion species of microorganism. The things that we cannot see with our naked eye. Now this is a very recent estimate as of 2017. And that is one six zero 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 separate microorganisms. This is saffron, by the way. She's feeling needy, so I'm holding her for a minute. She'll probably have down in a minute. So 1.6 billion microorganisms. The rest are plants, animals, fungi, all of that. So we use microscopes in order to see those things, all of those things that we can't see. So there are a couple of key terms that I would like you to know here. So in order to see things bigger, we need to magnify them. So the term magnification refers to the ability to make objects seem larger than they actually are in life. And resolution is our ability to distinguish detail because once things get so small, we can't really see them together. And resolution is the closest, or if being able to see the distance between two points. And the resolution of our eyes is about 0.1 millimeters. If we had two dots, 0.1 millimeters apart, if they got any smaller, we wouldn't be able to distinguish them. So that's, that's the limitations of our eyes. So we can view objects a thousand times smaller just with these light microscopes and with other microscopes like the scanning electron microscopes and transmission electron microscopes and even ones that use lasers like confocal and SRAS, they are ways to view things that are even smaller. We're talking on the nanometer scale, which is billionths of a meter. So we can also, in you probably understand the word contrast. So if we're using contrast between two colors, it's just the difference between light and dark. And we can use uh, the contrast of the microscope. Um, the, we can adjust the contrast to be able to see things really well. Now, a lot of things that are living are actually transparent, like our own cells. If we took some of our own cells, say skin cells, and looked at them under the microscope, they would actually be transparent. So we use dyes for that. And you're gonna be using a couple of dyes like iodine and methylene blue in lab in order to see cells more clearly. As early as the early 1600s, microscopes were being invented and used to view things smaller than the eye could see. So Galileo actually made a microscope um, early in the 1600s, 1609. And he would looked at things kind of, it was more like a magnifying glass than a microscope. But when Robert Hooke came around in the mid 1600s, he actually viewed so many different things and drew gorgeous pictures um, and published a book called Micrographia. And this was his microscope in the center here. This was Robert Hooke's microscope. So he actually had a lamp to illuminate his light source and this water flask actually acted like a big magnifier of the light. So it, it focused the light and made it brighter in one point where he could look in it down here. And he had two lenses, one at the end and one at where the ocular would be. And then Van Leeuwenhoek, I'm going to turn off the video for a minute so you can actually read this if you like. I don't know if it's still recording the video, but I think we'll see. Um, so this is his, he, he could magnify things more than 200 times. And he found that the smaller the lens, the higher the magnification. So he used really high quality glass and really talented lens grinders to be able to see. And he could actually focus things by moving this screw here 
in and out. It would move the specimen back and forth, kind of like our stage would, but he would put the specimen on the end of a needle to view them. It's probably hard to imagine not understanding what microorganisms are, but it's true that before microscopes were invented, they had no idea what might be in water, in food, proper refrigeration wasn't really a thing back then. They probably knew that keeping food hot would not make them sick, and maybe if they were kept a little colder, it wouldn't make them sick, but they didn't know why they got sick. And one of my favorite images, I don't recall when this is drawn, but I absolutely love this picture, this, this piece of artwork. It's called Monster Soup, and this is a drawing of some, a visualization of what people might have seen if they looked in the Thames River water. Of course, the Thames runs through London, and cleanliness was not as it is today. People didn't have access to showers or toilets or anything like that, so anything and everything went into the water. And so let's just appreciate this woman's horrified face for looking at uh, what they could see under the microscope for the very first time, being able to see that there are creatures living in the water that are too small to see, and lots of them, and very different ones. So I really like this picture. This is a compound light microscope. It's called a compound light microscope because there are multiple lenses you look through to view your specimens. These are the oculars and you have the objectives. There should be four on each microscope. So there are some rules for handling because these are delicate and expensive pieces of equipment. The first rule, and this is under part two of your pre-lab, is to always carry the microscope using two hands. You want one under the base and the other gripping the arm right here. This is the arm. So carry with two hands. If you need to have a classmate open a drawer or cabinet for you, ask them to do that so you can not let go of your microscope at any time with one of your hands. Be gentle when picking up or putting down. They do have rubber feet on the bottom, but please don't slam it on the counter. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. Do not touch any of the lenses that includes here in the objectives or the oculars up top. Please do not touch these with your fingers. You have oil on your hands that smudge them and it's particularly difficult to get off. Clean lenses only with lens paper, or we can use Q-tips and lens cleaner. So it doesn't scratch and it will be lint-free. It won't leave little bits behind. Number five, when putting it away, move your objective, these are your objectives, to the lowest one, the 4X objective. Raise the stage all the way up and wrap the cord around the base. As you see, the cord is already wrapped around the base like this. And the stage in this case is all the way down. Now this is preference between instructors. I prefer mine all the way up, but the other instructors prefer all the way down. So we're gonna change that to all the way down because I'm the only one who likes it this way, but that's all right. When you are finished, dispose of things where they belong. We save microscope slides to be reused for other classes. The cover slips, however, those go in the trash with any samples. And if you can see that, it's a tiny piece of clear plastic. So let's list the parts of the microscope. Let's start at the bottom. Down here we have the base. The base is the support for everything on the microscope. On the front of these older microscopes, which is an Olympus CH2, they are great old microscopes, pure workhorses. There is an on-off switch. And if I plug this in, we will see the light source turn on and off. There's the light source. That's this and you can adjust the brightness with this knob here. 
It might be slightly different on the newer microscopes, but the essentials are the same and the mechanics are the same. If we take a look at the main body, this is called the arm. This is called the head. This is not on the paper, but that's okay. This is called the head and it can be turned around using unscrewing the screw and turning it around. If you do choose to turn it around, this is how I like to use the microscope with the objectives facing me, you must tighten that screw or else this can fall off. It's extremely expensive and it falls off easily, so let's not do that. You look through the oculars or eyepieces. Neither one works for me. If it's blurry in one eye, you use the diopter adjustment. Don't worry about the numbers or anything on here. You're just looking to see if it's in focus. You can see that it moves up and down. We'll go through that in a few minutes. So the arm supports the nose piece right here. The nose piece, nose piece is a rotating ring that contains the objective lenses. There are four objectives on all of these microscopes. There is a 4X objective, a 10x objective in yellow, 4x is red, a 40x in blue, and a 100x in white. We do not use the 100x in class here. We'll talk about that more later. So if we move down here, this is called the stage. The stage is where you place your microscope slides. There is something on here called a stage clip. This moves back and forth. It is spring loaded, so you can actually break your slides if you release it too quickly. But your slides go here. You place it in this slot and you gently lower the stage clip and your slide is clipped in and ready to go. Let me turn up the light source a bit. So the stage clip holds the slide. On the other side here you have two knobs that move the stage forward and backward or move the slide holder forward and backward and left and right. These are really nice and different from old microscopes because they're mechanical and you can actually very precisely position where you'd like your slide. And old microscopes used to have to move the slide itself. It's very tedious. So that was very annoying. But now we have these really lovely um, stage adjustment knobs. To bring your specimen into focus, you're going to use the focus knobs. There are two. There's the course adjustment, which moves the stage up and down. It's this large knob on the inside nearest the arm. It moves the stage up and down. That was the microscope, not the slide, by the way. It's a little old and creaky. Moves the stage up and down. The fine focus knob is this little one here, and it moves the stage only tiny, tiny bits at a time. This gets things really, really sharp when you're focusing. So you'd have to move it for a really long time to get your stage to move. Down below, I'm going to move the camera. This here is called the condenser. This takes the light and it focuses it to go through this tiny little hole where the slide is. If we take the slide off, you can see it better. This is where the light comes through to view your specimens. So down here we have the condenser. That's this part. If I put a piece of paper, you can see it a bit better. And this is the iris diaphragm. There is a tiny knob, a little slider that goes left and right, that opens and closes what's called the iris diaphragm. The iris diaphragm controls the amount of light that comes through your sample. If you take a look up here at where the, the specimen will be, you can see that if I open the iris diaphragm, light comes through, and if I close it, very little light comes through. So this is a really good way to adjust the sharpness and brightness of 
your objects that you're looking at. So that's all the parts of the microscope. If we take a look at part three on page two of your lab handout, there's a really nice figure there that gives a good idea of what you should expect to see with your lenses while looking through them and looking at the profile from the side. So if we have the 4x objective, it's quite far away at 25 millimeters or so from your slide. And the lens itself is quite large. It takes up most of the space if you were to look at the, actually lift it up or, or look at the end of the lens. It's a large lens, which means it has a large field of view, FOV. If we move closer using our 10x objective, notice that it has a slightly different shape and that lens is quite a lot smaller. Remember Van Leeuwenhoek knew that the smaller the lens, the more magnification you can get. And that principle applies here as well. Please don't ask me about advanced optics because I really, really don't know very much, but I do know that that's true. And so what you will see also is you will get even closer to your specimen. Small lens, smaller field of view, and you have to be closer to be able to see it. Now, when you move up to your 40x objective, you're going to be very, very close to your slide, which is why it's extremely important to never use the course focus when on your 40x objective ever, 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 because if you move that slide up, you will smash your slide right into that objective. And that is big bad news. So you will be very, very close at about half a millimeter. So you also must be in focus before you change from the 10 to the 40. Now it takes a little practice and that's okay. We have plenty of time to work. So you should get the hang of it okay. And the field of view is also going to decrease quite a lot as well. It's got an even smaller lens, so you will see even less of your slide than you could before. Now, as far as light intensity goes, the brightness does increase as well. If I'm taking a uh, decrease, sorry. If I am looking at, say, the letter E at the 4x magnification, it will look nice and bright and you will have a lot of contrast let's do it not in a color so you will see a lot of contrast here so you can let a lot of light in and you will see your letter e now if you don't adjust the iris diaphragm or your light source what you're going to see is going to be a lot darker and less contrast. I can't make this any bigger than I know of. Let's see, can I do that? Oh, I can color it, that works. You will see less contrast with your letter E. And so you will have to play with the iris diaphragm in order to adjust it. Now on your 40X, I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger so you can kind of get the idea. You will see only a piece of your letter E and it's going to be quite a lot darker. I didn't know that I could color, that's great. It's supposed to be like a highlighter, but this works just fine. Your contrast is not going to be very great and you'll only be able to see a little bit of it. So you will have to mess with your iris diaphragm to get it to focus just right. So every time you change magnification, you must use the fine focus knob in order to focus. And these, mag these uh, microscopes are really great because you should not have to move it very far. They're what we call parfocal, which means that changing the objective does not change the focus very much. So you shouldn't have a whole lot of problems with that. But again, it's practice. That's what we're going to have plenty of time to do during lab. Now that you know all the parts of the microscope, let's talk about how to actually focus a specimen because this takes a bit of finesse and it also takes a bit of practice, but knowing the basics of how to do it is the place to start. 
So this is part four on your lab, how to focus a specimen. You always want to begin on the lowest power objective, which means in this case, this short one, the 4x. So we're gonna change it to that and you hear, I don't know if you can hear it, it clicks into place. You will know when it clicks into place. It doesn't want to move after that. And when you position your stage, position your stage all the way up. I find that this is the easiest way to get a clear picture. So you're going to push your coarse focus knob, this one, the one that moves the stage until it moves all the way to the top. All the way up. It's going to stop before it gets anywhere close to hitting this particular lens. Next, you want to make sure your iris diaphragm is all the way closed. Do you see here how much light is coming in? That's a lot of light. If I were to look through these oculars right now, it would be extremely bright and actually painful on my eyes. So I'm going to close the iris diaphragm all the way. So you can see that now there's a lot of light. And if we close it, there's only a tiny bit of light that comes through. So we're going to place the slide on the stage. Now this slide is just a piece of pink post-it note to demonstrate. We're going to put it on the stage and clip it in. And remember to release the clip gently so it doesn't slam into your slide and break it. Now I'm going to look through the oculars and use the coarse focus knob to bring the specimen into focus. And you want to make sure that the specimen is in the center of the field of view. I will show you what that means. So it's easy to take a look at the stage and you can actually see if your specimen is over the light source. You obviously want it to be over the hole so you can see it. So now you see that the light, can get to focus, is shining directly underneath my little post-it note there. So you look through the oculars and use the coarse knob to bring it into focus, which means bringing the stage down a bit. Now this is purely a piece of paper, but it's about in focus right here. So I didn't have to move the stage very far, maybe, I don't know, eight millimeters or so, not very far. I'm going to adjust it a little bit. You can move your left and right to be able to see it better. All right, so now I am in focus here and I want to use, I want to use higher magnification. So I'm going to change it to the next power objective. Now be careful here. Don't change it to the oil immersion lens, the 100X objective. Make sure you go the opposite way to get to the 10X objective, which has yellow. So you see how this says, EA100, you can focus here, there we go, oil, that's the oil immersion lens that we are not using. We are, however, going to be using this one, it says EA10 and EA40. That's a 10x objective and the 40x objective. We will be using those, but not the 100. I will have a demo slide for you to look at that, but not use it yourself. That is for microbiology for looking at bacteria specifically. So to increase the magnification, I'm going to change from the 4x, this little shorty, to the 10x. I'm going to rotate it slowly by the nose piece. Please do not rotate by grabbing the lenses. These are very expensive. So let's grab the nose piece and turn it till it clicks into place. I felt it click. And now you're going to use the fine focus knob, this little one, to adjust it just a little bit to get into focus. Now here is where it's important to make sure that your specimen is in the center of your field of view so you don't have to go hunting for it later. So I've turned the fo fine focus knob maybe one and a half times and now I'm on in focus on the edge of my paper. Now there are a couple of other adjustments you can do here that aren't listed. One of them is to adjust the width of the eyepieces. 
So if you look here, if I move one, they move apart. Everybody's eyes are slightly different distances. Mine is about 61 or 59. So if I adjust it to there, it's got little markings right here. It doesn't really matter if you memorize that. But whatever you do to see perfectly inside. Let me see if I can get this here so you can see inside. Oh, that's sort of what I see. It's pretty difficult with <laughs> this camera. Uh, sort of. There we go, the edge of the paper. So I'm at 10x magnification on my objective, and this is great. So you use the fine focus knob and adjust the light source and the iris diaphragm to get optimal light intensity. Now, optimal has a little star next to it because this is all about what you can see, and it depends on the specimen. Sometimes you want less light to make it sharper, or sometimes you want more light to see more of a specimen. So this is really up to you, but do start with it closed because otherwise it's much too much light. And finally, if you notice that your eyes are slightly different focus, like one looks blurry and one looks normal, use the diopter, this right here. Now this one doesn't have a diopter, this just has a lens that comes straight out. But this one has a ring on it. So you see that you can turn and it changes the depth of the eyepiece, the ocular. So you can get them both into focus with each other. You might have to mess with your fine focus knob a little bit to fix that. This one right here. But otherwise, it should be okay. So it looked like mine was out of focus because I messed with it earlier. So I've got my right one in focus, so I'm going to lower the left one a little bit, open both eyes, and now they're both in focus. If you have trouble looking through with both eyes, you can actually use the opposite lens. So if I use my left eye to look in the right, you can look there and your eye will actually, your brain will actually get rid of this other image with enough practice. I actually use my right eye if I'm going to do this, but I prefer to use both. So number six on this list is do not use the oil immersion lens unless specifically instructed to do so. During this course, you will not be instructed to use this lens at all. I will have demos up for you to see with that. Some tips for focusing. Always center the specimen before changing objectives. If you don't have it centered, you're going to lose it when you increase your magnification and it takes some time and it's very annoying to have to go back in magnification to view your specimen again. Letter B is very, very important. Do not use the coarse focus magnification on the coarse focus knob on high magnification. And let me show you why. Here is my slide. I'll try to hold this as steady as possible because I'm holding it with my hand. So there's my slide. Do you see how close the 10x objective is when it's in focus? It's very close to the specimen. If I use the coarse focus knob that moves it up and down, I can risk smashing my specimen right into that lens, especially when on even higher magnification. If I change it over to the 40, it's even closer. So here's the, the knob. I could actually smash the slide, and I really don't want to do that. So only, only, only use the fine focus knob, this one right here, to move it. Because notice that I can turn it and turn it and turn it, and it doesn't move the stage except a tiny, tiny bit. All right, so never, ever use that coarse focus knob when you're on high magnification. You don't want to smash the slide or the objective. And then finally, the last tip I have is to adjust the light intensity using the iris and the light source. So this takes some practice and to see exactly what you wanna see, you're going to adjust this to your optimal light conditions. If you get in higher magnification, you might have to add more light. 
and you might like less light coming through here. So it's all about playing with it. So that's why I'm doing a pre-lab with this. So you have an entire class period to play with the microscope and really get used to it. Because this is an important skill when you are in biology. This is our most important tool. Part of knowing how to use a compound light microscope is knowing how to calculate the total magnification that you'll be looking at your specimens. So remember that I called this a compound light microscope. It's called a light microscope, obviously, because it has a light source as a source of illumination. But it's got compound because it has two sets of lenses. The first set you look through are the oculars. And they have lenses in them. And those lenses are what we call 10x magnification. So if you were to just look through one of those oculars, you would see things 10 times bigger than they normally are. Well then, in addition to the oculars, we have the objectives here. And the objectives multiply the magnification of the oculars by whatever magnification they are. And we have four of them on our microscopes. So we have the 4x, the 10x, 40x, and the 100x. Now remember that the 100x is the oil immersion and we do not use that in this class, but you should have a basic understanding of what it does. So let's calculate the magnification. So I said that the oculars have 10x magnification or 10 times. I say 10x because that's what I learned. So that means every time you look through the microscope, everything is going to be magnified at least 10 times. So in your table on page three of your lab, um, this is part five, your objective will always, sorry, your ocular, wrong spot, will always be 10x magnification, always. So you always have at least that much. And we have four levels of magnification. Let's go low to high. So let's talk about the shortest one, which is the 4x objective. Let's do that one in blue. The 4x objective is short. If you look at the figure in uh, on page two of your lab, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. There, there it is. This figure. It shows you the length of some of the different objectives, the 10, the, the 4, and the 40. So it's the shortest one, and it has the lowest magnification, and we call it the scanning objective. It's called the scanning because you can scan across the surface of your sample and a very wide spot of it in order to see your sample and, and pinpoint exactly what you want to look at. So that is 4x magnification. And in order to calculate the total, you simply multiply them. So the total magnification of the scanning plus the ocular is going to be 40x magnified, which means whatever you're looking at is 40 times bigger than it appears in life. The next one up is the 10x objective. Let's do this one in orange. The 10x objective, it's a little bit longer but it also magnifies more. And we call this the low power objective. Ten X. And again, we're going to multiply times the ocular to get 100 X or 100 times magnified. So whatever you're going to look for, through, whatever you're going to look at through the 10 X objective will be 100 times bigger than it appears in life. Now let's move forward to the 40x, which we call the high power objective. You also might see it as high dry. So it's high power, but we don't use anything on it like the oil immersion does. And so this is 40x 
magnification. 40 times 10 is 400 X. So it's going to be 400 times bigger. And then finally, the oil immersion, which we will not use, that's its name. Is 100 X. 100 times 10 is 1000 times magnified. So this is how you calculate the total magnification. In order to actually view your specimens, you'll need to know how to make what's called a wet mount slide. Now this is part eight on page four of your pre-lab material. So to make a wet mount, this means taking water or something suspended in water, putting it on a slide and putting a cover slip over the top. So you'll need some supplies as you'll see in a list. If you're doing a specimen that is already in water, you don't need water. You just need the liquid with the specimen in it. And I'm sorry if the focus is weird on this. This camera keeps trying to focus on the background instead of what I'd like it to. So hopefully it will fix that soon. So what you'll need is a slide and your sample and a cover slip. So the cover slips come in these little boxes and they are thin, clear pieces of plastic and they're separated by little paper pieces, which greatly annoys me and feels like a huge waste. Um, so those can be discarded. But to make a wet mount is very simple. So you'll need your cover slip, you'll need your slide, and you'll need your specimen or your water. So to make a basic wet mount with just say a specimen, let's say that this bottle of water actually has, let's say it's pond water. So I'm gonna take my dropper, take one drop of the sample, put it right in the middle. There it is. Let's get closer here. Right in the middle. Now you're going to take your cover slip, place it at a 45 degree angle, and look at that water there. Look how it's spread along the cover slip along the bottom. And if you gently place that down, the water will spread and you can push it down a little bit if you need to and it spreads completely under the slide. So it's flat, there are no bubbles, that's what the 45 degree angle thing is about. And you can look at it immediately. So look at the profile. It's barely bigger than the slide itself. So you can really get a good idea of what your specimens are. Now this only works for flat specimens. Okay, you can't put 3D things under here because they won't flatten out. Now what about making a slide of an actual specimen? So this is a non-liquid solid sample. So here's a new slide. And I'm going to put a drop of water here in the middle. Same thing. There's a bubble, so I'll pop that. Now I'm going to make a slide of Elodia. It's an aquatic plant that has very thin leaves that are great for viewing under the microscope. So I'm just going to pull off one little leaf. She watched me there. Pull off a single little leaf. There it is. One little leaf, and I will place it on the water in the slide. Oh, I got two leaves, that's okay. So this leaf is now in the water. Now, step two says use the dropper to add another drop of water. Now we can do that, but it's not really necessary. It is with things like onion skin, but not with the Elodia. So same thing, I'm gonna take a new cover slip with a new stilly piece of paper, toss the paper away, place the cover slip at a 45 degree angle so the water spreads out along it. You probably saw that happen. Gently lower. And notice that there is a big bubble here. So this might be a case where we can add another drop of water. And you can literally just add a drop of water to the edge of the cover slip. And it's not focusing. There we go. And now we see that we do have a bubble 
but it's not on our specimen. You can even press it down a little bit to get rid of any extra bubbles. So now, here we have a beautiful little wet mount. <laughs> Maybe. Does not want to focus. Let's try a piece of paper behind it. There's our wet mount slide, the elodia leaf, ready to be looked at under the microscope.